Being loved. Well, uh, this week my wife celebrated another revolution around the sun, and so we celebrated her. Yeah, um, she's not in here, but I'll tell her you somebody wooed for her. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> she's next door, but uh, uh, we her favorite restaurant is in Disney Springs, and so we went to Disney Springs to eat at her favorite restaurant. And uh, we, you know, have you heard there's a drone show now? Like they don't do the fireworks; it's drone show. Uh, it's pretty exciting. We had not seen it yet, so we're like, we're gonna stay, uh, make it a late night, and we're gonna watch the drone show. And uh, we 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 did. Um, there is, it was pretty fascinating. Like, it's, it's really impressive what they can do. Um, but um, as we're there, like, we're watching the weather patterns and everything. Like, before the sun had fallen, there's this massive wall of storms that was kind of close. And, like, we're just thinking, like, I don't know if this is going to work and everything. But we made it. Like, it was beautiful. Um, as we were leaving the drone show, you know, there's already this mass exodus of people trying to leave. Um, and then it starts to let loose. And so now we're kind of, like, running, but then getting stuck in a crowd and running and everything. But, like, it was just this fun, like, conclusion to the evening. Like, we made it. Like, we were able to watch the show before the sky let loose and all this stuff. And my daughter, um, without skipping a beat, is like, well, that's because I prayed and asked God to not let it rain. It's like, man, um, it's so beautiful. That, like that childlike faith and like she prays and she expects it. And the thing is like that has been fairly consistent with her. That, like when it comes to weather patterns, she will pray something and, and it happens and, and it's beautiful. And I want to encourage that. And I don't know if you're with me, parents, like you want to encourage that childlike faith that Jesus says, we should have faith like a child, like to come to dad and just ask like, because you love me, would you, would you let me enjoy this thing? Like, we should have that kind of faith. And we also know, like, we live in a world where, like, it could be that two miles down the road, somebody's little campfire got out of control and it's threatening to burn down their house and they're praying desperately, God, please make it rain. So so who does God listen to? And I, I want to, again, foster that faith in my child and all this stuff, encourage that. But also, like, I don't want her to be heartbroken and I don't want her to have a crisis of faith when she prays, God, don't let it rain so I can enjoy this, and it rains. And so you live in that tension, and the reality is that tension exists because we don't control God, and we are not in control of so many things. It's a question of authority. Like, what authority do I have? What authority does God have? What authority does my daughter have? What authority does my son have? What authority do any of you have? What authority is there? And so we're in this new series, um, taking up the second half of summer called Family Dynamics. And so last week we started off looking at adoption, that we all come into the family of God, adopted in through the Son. And the beauty of that, that it's grace. Like you don't get adopted into a family because you have merit to get into that family. Like the Father says, I love you and I chose you before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before me, predestined to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ. And so we come into this family of God by way of adoption. The beauty of that, that we get to be here and he wants us to be in this family. And we started there because if we want to have healthy nuclear families, like the family that you live with, if we want that to be healthy, we need to first understand what it is to be in the family of God. That we as a church are a family. And so, yes, made up of many families, and yet now we are all part of a family. And that's why this is applicable. This entire series is applicable to every one of us. Whether you are married, single, divorced, widowed, anything, you all should find this to be applicable because we are all in the family of God. And so when we talk about what it is to be a parent or what it is to be a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter, in any case, there's much to be learned and practiced because we are actually in a family. Um, I, I talk to, I do a lot of premarital counseling and one of our sessions is about kids and sometimes I've, ha- I've, I've gone through sessions with you like, well, we're not gonna have kids or that's so far off, what does this matter? Like, well, you, you're not far off from the call of being a disciple maker. That you should be raising up others in the Lord. And good parenting principles are just good discipling principles. And so this is all relevant for us because this is how Paul said it in 1 Timothy chapter 5, the first couple of verses. He says, don't rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters with all purity. We are a family. And so we all relate to each other in the household of God as family. 
And so as we go through this, we're now jumping into Ephesians chapter six. If you wanna make your copy of scripture ready, Ephesians chapter six will also be on the screen behind me. And so um, as we're getting ready to read that, I want us to see kind of where we are in this. Um, this is in kind of Paul's typical structure. Um, Paul will write a letter and often uh, with, with just one variance really of Galatians because they're crazy. Um, but he, what he does is he starts off with his greetings and all this stuff and he kind of tells you what the letter is generally going to be about. Um, and he gives this prayer of thanksgiving and he unpacks the gospel and great beauty. And then after unpacking the gospel and what we would call indicatives, this is indicatively true or it indicates something that is true. This is your position in Christ. God has justified you, has made you righteous by grace through faith. Then he gets into what's called the imperatives, that because this is true, now you live out obedience in this way. And he starts to make application. And so when we get to Ephesians chapter six, last week, we were in that gospel um, indicative portion of like, this is your positional state. And now we are in the imperatives that he is making application because you have been saved by grace through faith, live in holiness in this way. And so we have come to that point in Ephesians chapter six, starting in verse one. You ready for this? It says, children, obey your parents and the Lord because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. Children, obey your parents and the Lord because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. Um, in context, what is happening here is this is actually a continuation of a list. If you go back to chapter five, verse 21, Paul says, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. So he's like, keep your eyes on the gospel. Remember how you came into this family. And now living that out, you're submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. And then he starts to unpack what that looks like going through different strata. Um, starting with the family, he goes with husbands and wives. In a couple of weeks, we'll talk a lot about that. Husbands and wives submitting to each other. And then children, submitting to your parents. And he's gonna continue on. He'll get to slaves and masters and things like that. But as we're looking at this, this is what it looks like to submit to one another in the fear of Christ. Children, obey your parents and the Lord. And there's great beauty in this. Who is Paul talking to in that verse? That sentence, children, obey your parents and the Lord because this is right. Who is Paul addressing? He's directly addressing children. The assumption would be, kids, you're listening to this letter being read. And going forward, as this letter would be circulated and used in the churches, scattered throughout the world, that children would hear this. Hearing Paul say, by the inspiration of the Spirit, children, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. I think it's amazing that Paul would include children in the household of God. That Paul is talking to them. Like, yes, you're a part of this. Kids, you're a part of this. And personal faith uh, our, our conversion, that, that faith becomes our own. That, like, you are not just born a Christian because you were born into a Christian family. You know that? You must put your trust in Jesus to be your rescuer, to be your salvation. You must personally confess his lordship. You must believe in your own heart that God raised him from the dead. And Paul is saying, hey kids, I'm talking to you just like I'm talking to them. And that's a beautiful model for us, right? Because while it is true that each of our kids must have their own personal faith, we don't just wait. You don't, you don't sit there and just wait, like kind of twiddling your thumbs, like one day they're gonna make a profession of faith and then I'm gonna jump all over it. I'm gonna disciple them so good. No, you start from the beginning, discipling them in the full counsel of scripture. And you wait and you pray desperately for the day when that faith becomes their own, but you treat them the same all the way through that you want them to know the gospel from the youngest age imaginable. And you keep teaching them the truths of God all the way through. You treat them like Paul. The assumption is you're a part of this family. I'm gonna treat you like such. That is really beautiful. Um, and I just wanna give you a quick heads up. Uh, we, we want to be way more intentional about that as a church that we, we have a kids ministry, like the kids left here, and you may be wondering, if, if Paul spoke specifically to kids, why did we send the kids out? <laughs> we'll get there in a few minutes. But here's the thing. We have a kids ministry, 
and we make it emphatically clear with leadership of that and anyone serving in that, that our aim is to partner with you as parents. Because in the 45 minutes that they have to try to teach them a Bible lesson and all that stuff, to pour the love of God into them, that is nothing compared to the amount of time that you have with them. That is nothing compared to the amount of influence that you have with them. You are primarily tasked with discipling your kids and the church gets to partner with you in that. And that's a beautiful partnership, but it is a partnership. And so we want to do this. Uh, I, this is not original to me. I've heard this from many people. But the idea is like, you cannot control when your child becomes a believer. Like you cannot like, just like ram in saving faith into them. What we can do is pray that God would save them. And so it's, it's this idea of like you stack kindling around them. You can't start the fire, but you can put a lot of kindling around them so that when the fire lights up, they are ready to go. And that's what we want to do. And so please do that. Um, As we approach the new year, I know we're halfway through, and so we're looking out a bit, but as we approach the new year, we're going to start a new segment of our gatherings every week where we will start with New City Catechism. It's a resource that we already give at baby dedication or child dedication, um, but there's a question for every week so that we can go through a formal catechesis that what is the chief end of man? Or what is our only hope in life and death? That we are not our own. We belong entirely to the Lord. And so what is that based on? And you get Romans 8. And we're going to do that weekly, that we'll start with a question and we'll read together this question and this answer and then we will give you these resources so that throughout the week that can be a consistent conversation with videos and other things for you to utilize at home. Because like we talked about last week, eating together matters, right? Eating together matters. Because at that table, we express what we value. And at that table, we want to have intentional conversations to raise our kids up in the way of the Lord. And so, back to this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. And then he starts to quote. In your copy of scripture, it may have quotation marks around it, or what is common in the CSB is it actually becomes bold font. Um, This is actually a quote from the Old Testament when you see that. So he is quoting, this is actually Exodus Um, Exodus 20, verse 12, honor your father and mother. And then he gives this quick little thing, which is the first commandment with a promise. So there's reasoning behind this, so that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. Again, quoting the Old Testament. This is a quote from the fifth of the 10 commandments as we know them. And so this command in the Decalogue, in the 10 commandments, Paul is citing that as reasoning for why children, you should obey your parents. It's a command and it comes with reasoning. There's a benefit that is derived from it. And so we should all be asking, because we're all children, right? You're the child of someone. What does it mean to honor my parents? And as seasons of life change, like that gets tricky, right? Like when I was a kid, I knew what it meant to honor my parents. And then I became 18 and I was still in their house. And like, what does it mean to still honor them? But like, I'm, I'm my old man. And then you move out and you're like, they're still calling me and expecting things. Like, what does it mean to honor them? And and then I get married and now they're like, you're going to come here on this holiday. And they're like, we're going to come there. I'm like, I don't know what to do. How do I honor all of you? And you continue through each stage of life asking, what does it mean to honor my parents? And so what is it to honor our parents? Let's start with the easy one, children. What does it mean for a child, for children to honor their parents? Well, Paul actually told us explicitly, children, obey your parents. For a child to honor mom or dad is to simply obey, is to do what they say, is to be obedient. That is honoring your parents. But then as adults, while we are aging, while they are aging, we are to continue to honor them, even if we are no longer under direct submission to them. Uh, One of my favorite passages to go to and understand what that looks like, this is Proverbs chapter 23, verse 22. This is what it says. Listen to your father who gave you life. And don't despise your mother when she is old. You want to honor your parents? That's a pretty good verse to look to. Listen to your father. Listen. Actually, listen to your father who gave you life. And don't despise your mother when she is old. What does that mean? If I could make it a little simpler for you. To honor your parents means to care about them and to care for them care about your parents. When they're no longer disciplining you, when they're no longer telling you what to do, how to live your life, you can still honor them by caring about them and caring for them. 
especially as they grow older and re-enter that dependency stage of life. And so for some of us, you're like, yeah, absolutely. Like I, I fully owe that to them. I should take care of them. And for others of you, that sounds terrifying because you think, I had awful parents and they were so hurtful to me. And you don't know what it would be like to step back into their life. I haven't talked to them in years. And I want to say, I, I hear you. And I would not ask you or advise you to step into something dangerous again. But I still think you can honor them. I think you can honor them in multiple ways. If there is a strained relationship, then uh, as a mentor once told me, when somebody hurt me a lot and then was just kind of shut off from me, wanted to pretend like I didn't exist. It's like, you know, every time you run into this individual, just hold your hand out. Like you're ready to shake hands. Look him in the eyes, ready to shake hands. And you know what will probably happen? He'll probably look away as fast as possible and walk away as fast as possible. And it may happen again and again and again, but every time you're around that person, just hold your hand out and you pray and you hope for the one day when you hold your hand out and that person actually looks you in the eyes and shakes your hand again. So maybe that's what it looks like for you, metaphorically, or maybe literally, is you have a strained relationship with your parents and it just looks like, hold your hand out and you can't force anything, but you can be there, extending the invitation. And the words of Paul in Romans 12, 18, if possible, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Why does he say if possible? Because sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes it's out of your control. But we do what we can to be people who are peacemakers. Again, this does not mean that you throw yourself into a dangerous relationship. It may be right and good that you have some boundaries with hurtful parents. Boundaries can be right and good, but they cannot be an excuse for refusing to forgive. Boundaries can be right and good, but they cannot be an excuse for forgiving or for refusing to forgive. We must forgive. Again, in the language of Paul to the church in Colossae, in Colossians 3.13, he says, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. How has our Lord forgiven us? At great cost to himself. There is nothing in me that deserves the forgiveness of God, but he gives it in grace. In love. Great pain. His own life was the cost of my forgiveness. He says, just as you have been forgiven, you should forgive others. So again, we, we hold that tension that it does not mean that you throw yourself into a dangerous relationship. You can have right and good, healthy boundaries, but you still must forgive. And we can live in that by the power of God. Only by the power of God. And, and I, I want to be very very honest with you, I know that that is far easier for people like myself who had really good parents. Some of you, that, that just conjures up incredibly hurtful things in you to even consider the idea of forgiving. And if you cannot do that, then I would say, you know what you do? You say that to God. You go to the Lord with that hurt, with that great pain and say, I, I know I'm supposed to forgive, but I just cannot right now because it hurts so much and you look to him for the healing that you need that you could then extend that grace that he has extended to you. So, children, obey your parents and the Lord because this is right. Does that sound familiar? Uh, we don't use that phrase because this is right as much, but um, if you've been in the backseat of my car um, or maybe your car growing up, or I don't know, I, I, I have thrown around the line because I said so. Have you heard that before? Because I said so. <laughs> Do you ever use that line? Did your parents use that line with you? Like, that's circular reasoning. Come on, you gotta help me out here. Like, what? This is an appeal to a highest authority. That you have no right to question this authority. That's what Paul is actually saying there. And that could bother us. Children, obey your parents and the Lord because this is right. Like, but, but is it right? <laughs> But is it right? Why is that so hard to accept? I think because authority can be so hard to accept and submit to in our day and age. We love individuality. We love autonomy. 
We love our freedom. Like we just celebrated the 4th of July and this nation has afforded us incredible freedoms. And yet so many ways we have taken this way too far. And we, we have like bought the lie, hook, line, and sinker, that ultimate freedom is having no restraint. And that's not true. Real ultimate freedom is living within the right restraint. We need authority over us. Uh, and it's not just our parents, actually. This, this is how the Westminster Confession um, talks about the fifth commandment as being about more than just our earthly father and mother um, that you were under the guardianship of. This is what it says. By father and mother in the fifth commandment are meant not only natural parents, but also peers in age and gifts, and especially such as by God's ordinance are over us in place of authority, whether in family, church, or commonwealth. Now, this idea of there being a right authority over us extends beyond the family. But it starts with the family. By the design of God, learning to live under the submission of authority begins in the family. It's authority because this is right. And again, we bristle at that like, but is it right? Is it right? If you knew the hurt of my parents, if you knew all these other things, where, like, we bring in all this baggage and say, but is it Right? Marshall Siegel, he writes about this and he says, parents are a first opportunity for children to receive, submit to, and obey God-given authority. Another compelling reason for God to make the world and the family as he did. Do you know what that means? Honoring parents is a picture and practice of what it is to honor God. When you honor your parents, what you are doing is you're practicing the act of honoring God. Because when we learn to live under authority and submit to that authority, it starts in the family, but it's not just about your family. It's learning there is a greater reality. There's a God who is sovereign. He is in authority over all. As Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. All of it. He has all authority. And we have to learn to live under that authority. And that's supposed to start with your family. But to honor or obey is going to require trust and submission. It's trust and submission to the authority over us. And again, we ask, but what about abuse of authority? And that is a very valid question. What do we do when we're called to submit to or to obey abusive authority? Like if we again talk about our family of origin, the good things that we tend to do and the bad things that we tend to do. If you go to counseling, do you know what is almost invariably going to happen when they see patterns in your life and you're trying to figure out why those patterns are there? They start talking about your childhood. Like, when did this start? What are the things that you grew up around that happened to you or happened around you and that shaped you? And when that's bad, what do we do with that? How do we submit to that kind of authority? Really, if this is supposed to point us to trusting God, to submitting to God, how do we even know that we can submit to or trust God? A lot of bad things happen and he says he's in control and has all authority. How do I reconcile that? How do I trust him with that? The answer is emphatically yes, you can trust God because of the gospel, because of the good news, because of the fact that there is God the Son who is co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father and God the Spirit. And God the Son stepped into his own creation, became like his own creation. God became a man in the incarnation. Jesus, born of a virgin, took on flesh and dwelt among us in submission to the Father, in full obedience to the Father, the Son came so that he could live a sinless life. So he would never mess up like you and I do every day. He would be the perfect sacrifice because his life was about his death. So that he would one day die and be the atonement, the forgiveness, the sacrifice, the paid penalty for us. That when he died on the cross, he was murdered on a cross, he was there in our place. And as we sang earlier, in my place he stood condemned. In my place. That when he died on that cross, it was because I should have been there, but he loves me. And he wants to be with me forever. And so he died so that I would not have to pay that penalty that I could never pay. He paid it in full. He died saying, It is finished. 
But then he rose again victorious over the grave so that we can live with him forever and know that the payment was sufficient. Our debt has been paid. We are actually free. And then, here's the thing, like, We'll talk about this again when we get to, to husbands and wives, but there's, there's this radical call, wives submit to your husbands, that again, can just make us bristle. Like, wives submit to your husbands, as to the Lord even, oh! I think like, but the husband's called to love his wife sacrificially, like Christ loved the church. That he died for us. And so if, if we are to look at what is a godly authority like, it's sacrificial to the point of death. And don't you want to submit to an authority who says, I care about you so much, I love you so much that I'm going to die for you because it means you're good. Like, man, authority can be such a beautiful thing. When you see the gospel, you know, yes, we can trust God. We can submit to his authority that he has every right to rule and reign over us. He's proven it. And so ultimately, the authority of God and the authority of all that is godly should be celebrated, should be trusted, it should be lived in submission to. Part of me really wanted to have the kids in here. Because again, like Paul says directly to the kids, children, obey your parents. And some of you parents are like, yeah, why didn't we keep the kids in here to hear that? Children, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. And the reason I didn't do that is because I think we actually have to start with a bigger issue before we start saying that to our kids. Um, and I might upset some of you, and I really don't want to do that. I, with everything I have, I mean this in love. But I think one of the biggest problems we have right now is that too often, many parents have abdicated their position and responsibility of being in authority over their kids. Hear me clearly. Your kids need you to be parents. They don't need you to be friends. They need you to exercise authority in their life. And that is what would be most loving for them. They need you to discipline them. They need you to correct them. They need you to be an authority over them. It is loving and it is right. Why is exercising authority over your children loving? One, because the reality is there are others that will be in authority over them. That is real. The authority of others over them is real. They will have to live in this world and learn to navigate what it is to be under other people who are in authority over them. You should help them learn what that's like at a very young age because otherwise it will crush them. As much as we love and we celebrate our freedom, our individuality, none of us are really that independent or sovereign. You can only be who you currently are because of what others have done for you. There are things that are more powerful than us. Like, stop paying your taxes and see what happens. They find you. Like they're, I, I'm not encouraging you to do something crazy like that. Like, but the point is, like, you are living under the authority of others. If we raise our kids in this like, make-believe fairy tale land where you can do whatever you want to, and there are never any real negative repercussions for that. Do you know how crushing that will be when they step outside of that bubble you've created? It will devastate them. It's not loving to do that to them. What's loving is to help them understand how to rightly navigate this world under right and godly authority. Uh, there, there's this, like, every, everyone is in full agreement that historically there has never been such a crazy increase in anxiety for our children. Over the last two decades, the, the number of clinically diagnosed children with generalized anxiety disorder and all kinds of other anxiety disorders has skyrocketed. And you know what is being consistently said? So much of that is because parents have abdicated the responsibility of being an authority over their kids. So much of it is also about social media. We'll talk about some of that stuff too coming up. There's, there's so many things that are weighing into this, but at the heart is if the parents would be in authority, then so many of those other things would actually be a non-issue. We must exercise authority for our kids. Think about this for yourself. I'll, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. Do you know what I never have anxiety about? I never ever have anxiety about the things that I'm in complete control of. There's not a lot of those things. But if I am convinced that I am in complete control of something, 
I feel zero anxiety about it. And so what do I need to do when I start to experiencing a lot of anxiety? I need to be honest with myself about how much control I actually have in that. And often, and like if, if you struggle with anxiety, I'm not saying that this is the remedy for everyone. But often for me, when I can just be honest and let go and say, I don't have control of that. So much of that anxiety is like, okay, all right, I'll do what I can do. As you raise your kids to realize they don't have as much control as they like to think they do. Like we live in a world with all these magic buttons. Like I do this and it does what I want and do this and it does what I want and I do this and this. And like there's so much control that we get to exercise like no other time in human history. And then when I don't get to control it, ah! help your kids know what it is to not have control and be okay. There are others in authority over them. Um, I'll use some other words, okay? If you're not convinced, this is a study published by the American Psychological Association stating, children raised in homes with less authoritative parenting report higher levels of anxiety and emotional distress, underscoring the importance of clear expectations and consistent boundaries in fostering emotional security. Or uh, this conclusion from the Journal of Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology, parenting practices have a profound impact on children's emotional health with authoritative parenting consistently associated with lower levels of anxiety and greater emotional resilience. I think God knows what he's talking about. We need to be in authority over our kids because they will be under the authority of others. It's going to happen. The other reality is God's authority. But remember, the family is supposed to be pointing to this greater picture of God's authority over them. God's authority over them is real. I hear the word of God from Isaiah 45, 7 to 9. He says, I form light and create darkness. I make success and create disaster. I am the Lord who does all these things. Heaven sprinkle from above and let the sky shower righteousness. Let the earth open up so that salvation will sprout and righteousness will spring up with it. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to the one who argues with his maker, one clay pot among many. Does clay say to the one forming it, what are you making? Or does your work say, he has no hands? For our kids to grow up and not realize that they will stand one day accountable to God would be such a tragedy. We must teach our kids there is a God. He is just. His wrath is real. There is due consequence for sin. But praise God, he is also merciful. He's gracious. He's compassionate. He's slow to anger. And so let our authority look like that. That when we exercise authority over our kids, we do it in a way that is compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful, steadfast love that we're quick to forgive. And yet, we are clear that there are expectations, there are boundaries, and they are for our kids' good. Let's be such parents. And then we can bring our kids in to say, hey, children, obey your parents and the Lord because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. Don't you want that? You think, okay, well, Paul, a little out of context there, right? Like, that was to the assembled Israelites, wandering in the wilderness, waiting to enter into the promised land, and here's this promise that, hey, honor your parents, and you'll get into that promised land, and you'll get to live a long time in it. Like, we're way beyond that, right? Is Paul wrong? Is he taking this out of context? No. Because believer, there is a promised land for you. That we look forward to the day when there is a new heavens and a new earth and we will inherit it. That we will get to rule and reign with God himself. We will be with him forever. He wipes away all the tears, death, pain, the former things will have passed away and we get to be in this place forever. So yes, the day is coming where it will go well with us and we will have a long life in the land by the grace of God. And so we praise him for this glorious grace. As the band comes, will you pray with me? Jesus, thank you. Uh, you modeled perfectly what authority actually should look like. 
You did not shy away from correcting, but you came in mercy and grace, with compassion. You were gentle. And guys, we look forward to the day when you return and know that the day of your return is actually going to be quite terrifying for most of this world, that we will stand in judgment. We thank you that as your people, we have been washed, we are clean, you have made us holy. Would you help us to raise our kids to know this, to celebrate this, to believe this gospel, and then to live in light of it and submit to authority that is right and proper. So we thank you. We love you. I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.